On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Kimber, and Kimber was married to a belittling physical abuser. It's a story of rage, walking on eggshells, guilt, never being good enough, and stalking. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me, we have Kimber. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being here. And if you want to be a guest like Kimber is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com and click the guest form button at the top of the page. There you can read all of our instructions and please read them all and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button and please do send it in the format that we ask for. And there is a content warning for today's survivor story as we do graphically discuss physical abuse and a suicide attempt. So that is your content warning for today. And today you're going to hear Kimber's story, and Kimber was married to someone who had their ego grow as their career grew, and she dealt with tremendous amounts of physical and emotional abuse throughout the relationship, and that didn't stop because even in divorce, the abuser went scorched earth and had a winning at all costs vindictiveness about them. So a big thank you to Kimber for being here with us today. And now I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Kimber, the floor is now yours. Um, well, you asked me about my childhood. I was from a great family. Um, I was an oops baby. I was born with two older brothers that were 12 and 14 at the time. So by the time I was born, my parents were older. Um, and I was a lonely child. They were always gone. I mean, by the time my brothers were in college, I was in kindergarten. And I would just, I hated being alone. I would just cruise all over the neighborhood looking for anybody to play with. I would even hang out with other parents. And I think that's a lot of my, I would guess the word is why I'm a people pleaser. You know, I was always looking for that companionship, that attention and doing what I needed to do to get that love that I didn't get as a child. You know, I wanted to grow up, have a career, get married, do all that good stuff. You know, I didn't have any traumatic experiences. The only thing I can say is that my older brother was diagnosed with schizophrenia and my parents had some issues with him. So, you know, growing up, I didn't have a lot of attention to me. It was more on taking care of my older brother and they traveled a lot. Well, I, my parents had a good marriage, so that's all I had to go from. Nobody in my family had ever been divorced. Um, so relationships was something that, you know, I was looking forward to. I was that little girl that wanted to grow up and get married. In high school, I had a boyfriend. He was older. He graduated a few years before me. And interesting enough, he was very jealous and controlling as well. He'd get upset when I would, I was a cheerleader, and he'd get upset when I'd have to host a dance or anything like that. So I wasn't very good at setting boundaries, even back then. So eventually you meet the person that this story is about. So uh, take us through the beginning of this meeting and what you liked about them, what they liked about you, and give us a good 3D picture of who they are. Um, we met in college. He was a cheerleader. Uh, he looked like a Ken doll. He was really cute and built and adorable. I was a student senator, and I was on the governing board of the sororities, and the cheerleaders were there doing an event, and I was like, wow, he's kind of cute. But I'm like, is he gay? Is he not gay? <laughs> so um, I didn't meet him that day, but then I met him a week later, 
at a fraternity party. And I was with my best friend and he was with a guy I went to high school with and I didn't know they were roommates. So that was the first time we met, but he instantly gravitated towards my friend. She was complete opposite of me. She's tall, skinny, curly brown hair. I, on the other hand, you know, long blonde hair, curvy, blue eyed. And so he gave her a ride home back to his apartment area. She had a date later. It was her birthday. And uh, he didn't have a car, but he had a moped. So he gave her a ride home. Um, Nothing happened. I guess she ate all of his food (laughs) and then went on her date. Um, But then after that, she said, you know, he wasn't interested in her, vice versa. But we kept running into each other on campus. It was almost like. Fate was throwing us together after that. And then one night I was at a party and an old boyfriend was there and he was bothering me. So he kind of swooped in, took over, and we hung out the whole night. And then we started dating after that. He came from a very poor, modest family. Um, He was working his way through college, doing the cheerleading, was working in the dorm, in the cafeteria. And he was really cute. Um, But he had this personality, this gregarious, outgoing personality. You know, when he walked in, the party started. And he had one of those voices that, you know, demanded, like, who's talking right now? Just one of those loud voices. Um, And he was fun. And he was a great dancer. We danced. And it's just like, um, he made me feel like I was the center of the universe. Came back to my sorority house the piano some of my sorority sisters sang and um and then we kissed and it was like fireworks and then he just after that we were inseparable i mean he loved bombing he would even though he didn't have any money he would do things like it came home one time and my dorm room was completely covered in posters he had made you know like little hearts and it was really cute So it all started off really good. Well, I was a year older, so I graduated from college and he had gotten an apartment and we actually moved in together for like six months. It was the two of us and three other guys. Um, I was still working at part time looking for a full time job. I guess the first red flags happened during that time. I saw he had a lot of anger issues. If we ever got in a fight, he would throw things. He even got to the point where he smashed the windshield on the car. Um, Yeah, and we were both working at bars at night at the time. So we were working together. So he was kind of in that party college mentality. Meanwhile, I was trying to work full time, you know, doing my internship and then working at the bar at night. And then I got a full time job and I moved an hour away and why he finished his last year of school. And um, so we were doing kind of the long distance relationship at that point. I would come back every weekend and see him sit at the bar, watch him bartend, pick up all these girls. Um, he always said he didn't pick up any of the girls, but now I wonder. And then he proposed right, you know, right when he graduated. So we got married right when he graduated. So before we get to when you get married, when the first red flags and you see that rage happen, uh, what is your response to that? And how do you feel about that? And do you address it or do you just kind of let it slide? You know, it's interesting because my first boyfriend in high school was the same. Um, Like I said, he was jealous and rages and threw stuff. And I'm thinking, is this how men are? My dad would get very angry and do something similar. Um, He never hurt me or struck me, but he would get mad. So I just kind of thought that's what men do (laughs) at the time. Um, Yeah, and then... Before we were married, when we were dating an exclusive, he went off. Um, they were in a cotton bowl, and he went off to California. 
And when he came back, he's like, I'm moving to California. I'm going to cheerlead there and they're going to pay for everything. Um, so it wasn't until he got back and I know she's in these pictures with this one cheerleader and he just got really odd. And he, he later admitted that he had had an affair with her when he was over there. So he cheated on me when we were engaged at that point. But he swore he would never do it. It was a mistake. It was a one-time thing. Um, yeah, like, of course I was upset. Um, but I believed him. He told me it was just a one-time thing. So eventually you do get married. So what happens from here? Yeah, we get married. Um That first year was a tough one. I was working a normal job. At that point, he was managing the bars and restaurants. So he's working two in the afternoon to 2 a.m. And I was working a normal job. So, and he was still kind of caught up in that whole party mentality. Um, But there's a couple of things, like he had some major rages, like I said, breaking the windshield in the car, smashing things. he even took the goblets my maid of honor gave us for our wedding. They were these beautiful silver goblets with crystal. And he threw them and smashed them. And I don't even know for what. Um, and it wasn't until later that he didn't have a car. So we had taken some of the money from our wedding and we bought him a car. And we were making car payments. And one day I was checking the account and I noticed on the car payments, he would write a thousand dollar car payment, but then the, the, the book would show only a hundred dollar payment. So it was like, where's that other $900 going? So then he later admitted he was gambling. Well, first he told me one of his employees had a gambling problem and owed all this money to a bookie. And so of course I, said something to that employee and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And then he later he admitted that he was the one with the gambling problem, gambled all our money away and lied to me about it. So at that point, I, it was one year into our marriage and it was not what I signed up for. But again, nobody had been divorced in my family. I had an obligation to my vows, but I did give him an ultimatum. I said, you need to get a real job. We need to get out of this town and you need to quit gambling and quit lying to me. So he got a job with a major company as a salesperson. They moved us to Iowa and we started over. And that's when my relationship married to a salesperson began. Well, he was with a big company. I was working still for a nonprofit. I was lucky, though. I got to transfer every year. Um, from office to office. I didn't make a lot of money doing it, but I enjoyed it. He was the major breadwinner at the time. And so the company would move us every two, three years. So I was alienated, you know, from my friends and family moving every couple of years. It was just the two of us. And it wasn't until we were married five years that we started having children. And then once I started having children, He focused more in on his work. I was focusing on, I was still working too, and then trying to raise children. Um, It wasn't until I was pregnant that he actually pushed me. Um, And I was like, wow, like I was pretty far along. And it's, it's anytime I would bring up or try to set a boundary, he would flip it on me and project back onto me. Like it was my fault. Like I deserved it. So it was my 30th birthday and I was working for a public relations firm and they had an art exhibit and it was Romero Brito. And I bought myself a painting for my birthday and he signed the book and signed the painting. I spent $450 on it. And if anybody knows Romero Brito, he's huge now. So that painting I bought is worth a lot more today. But when I got home, instead of going, oh, that's wonderful. You bought yourself a painting with the money I earned. He was furious. And 
became physical with me. Funny though, then he threw me a surprise 30th birthday party. And when I got home, he had taken that painting and wrapped it and put a bow on it and said, that was my present from him. And he later fought me over that during the divorce. When you get abused like that for the first time and there is a physical abuse, what is going through your head and how are you rationalizing everything and, and trying to make sense of what has just happened? Yeah, so it's my birthday. I'm at a restaurant. And then I saw that my painting was wrapped with a bow. And it's kind of like, what? I bought that for myself. Um, but he's, you know, it was, I did it without his approval. And so that was him taking his control back saying this is your gift now. Um, and we argued about it later that night. And again, he just, he berated me. How dare I buy something without his permission? Um, and I found too, the more he drank, the more physical he became. You know, so he had gotten drunk that night, was pushing me around and things. And the next morning I woke up and yeah, I was upset. You know, I, was, I thought, you know, I work. I deserve to buy myself a painting. Why should I need his permission? But he would put me on this crazy wheel, making me feel guilty. Like I owed him and I made a mistake by not passing it by him. And yeah, so it was my fault for like making a rash decision for my birthday. Yet he is someone who gambled all of this money and faced no repercussions. No. Yet when it's you here who makes your own financial decision on something to do for yourself, there's a double standard that has occurred here really early. And where you are an empathetic person towards him, he gets angry, rages, and uh, gets uh, physically abusive. Yeah, you hit that in a nutshell there. And then it just starts to increase from there on. As his, as his career grows, so does his ego. So with his career, you end up moving to Ireland. So what happens from here? Yeah, so we move overseas. Um, at that point, I have three children. My youngest is only six months old. So I become the quintessential executive wife, you know, PTA president. He's traveling a lot for work again. And I'm actually kind of glad when he's traveling. Um, but I also, our oldest son had special needs. He's on the autistic spectrum. So... It was a challenge for me because, you know, it's finding new schools, finding new doctors, finding treatment plans. Um, my ex couldn't handle the fact that my older son had special needs. He just flat out denied it, refused it, didn't acknowledge it. So, you know, by the time he would come home, I'm just like, I need you to watch the children or give me a break. You know, but I'd always get, well, I work all day. You're sitting at home doing nothing, <laughs> just eating bonbons with your feet up, you know, kind of thing. So that was a challenge. And then he started doing, um, getting more. We went to Amsterdam a few times and he started getting into marijuana and different kinds of drugs like that, too, in addition to his drinking. So that seemed to, like, spark a lot of his anger issues. I was like a Facebook page all the pictures on the front look like i had an amazing life you know we're living in this clifftop house we're traveling all over europe going to these amazing places but the minute we're home or alone he's abusive um, verbally physically it just it was it was ugly and i felt an obligation to stay because of my vows and also for my children uh, he controlled the finances. He controlled everything. So it wasn't like I could just pick up three children and leave. I had no money of my own. Everything was in a joint account. 
And I didn't really have a home base to go to. So I just kind of sucked it up. You know, I was alienated and he was controlling everything. And you just brought up verbal abuse. So what type of verbal abuses were going on toward you on a daily basis? You know, that's so interesting because I didn't even really realize any of this abuse until a girlfriend told me that she was leaving her husband because she was verbally abused and had read this verbally abusive book by Patricia Evans. And on the very first page, when I read that book, she said, therapy doesn't work with a narcissistic spouse when they hear they exaggerate everything they make a big deal out of everything um and they 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 just kind of belittle your feelings your thoughts for me the verbal abuse was everything you know at that point after three kids i was no longer size zero you know i gained some weight i also had to have a knee replacement i used to race downhill skiing and uh he didn't even go to my surgery. My dad came in and helped take care of me. You know, he just wasn't a caretaker. So I had to get friends and family to help me with the kids and with me. Um, the verbal abuse that I would get on a daily would be, you know, criticisms about my weight. You would make fun of my wrinkles that I'm starting to get. Give me guilt trips about going out to lunch with friends or any kind of activity that I enjoyed. I also started working part-time for the relocation company and selling my art. And he would critique it saying, you know, nobody would buy that, blah, blah, blah. You're wasting your money or our money or my money. It was his money at that time. Um, so, you know, he just wanted me to sit at home, take care of the kids. Didn't want me to go out or do anything or have any fun. So how do things uh, progress from here? Well, I think it was on a trip. It was spring break, and I had just had a knee replacement, and he insisted we go to St. Martin with the kids. And if anybody's ever had a knee replacement, you know it's a long healing process. So I expressed my concerns, um, but, you know, he, he coerced me into going. And we go to St. Martin, and I'm, I can barely walk. I can barely walk with a cane. And I can go on and on about this trip. But the moment I knew he truly didn't care about me is I had to do physical therapy. And I went with my kids into the ocean to do my exercises to get my knee to bend. And it was wavy, and I couldn't get out with the waves and the incline of the beach. So my kids, I said, go ask dad to help me get out. Well, he was busy sunbathing, you know, his ear pods in and he was catching a tan and he couldn't be bothered. And I waited and waited and he wouldn't come. So I finally tried to get out of the ocean and I fell. And my kids were trying to help me, but it was too hard because the waves were crashing. Meanwhile, I'm rolling around like a rag doll in the waves. My son runs and says, you know, dad, mom needs help. And he just sat there and he said, she'll figure it out. Meanwhile, my, I don't know, my daughter at the time's 10. She comes over and helps me out of the ocean. Um, I had this big group of people around me. People could see, I mean, I had the staples or whatever down my leg. So kind people went and got me some ice. At that point, I was just sitting there. My bathing suit had filled up with sand in every crevice, but I was rolling around like a rag doll. And it was, I know I did some damage to my knee on that day. And he finally, after seeing everybody around me, wandered over to see if I was okay. You know, just, I think it was just a safe face. And that point, I just got up and I went into the shower trying to clean all the sand out. And I just bawled my eyes out. Because I thought, how could he just leave me like that? How could he not care? Um, you know, see me in distress and do nothing. And that's when it really dawned, you know, at that point. Because there had been other instances before that, but I always just let it go. And he always made me say, like, well, for instance, when we checked into the hotel, 
they gave us the farthest room away and the blinds are broken. A bunch of things are broken. And I said, this is too far for me to walk to everything. I'm going to go ask if we can get a room closer to the front desk. Um, and he's like, well, I'm going to go eat. You good luck with that. And you can move all our stuff. Like he got mad at me instead of trying to help me. And the stories just go on from there. And at this time, your children are a bit older here. What is their relationship like with them? How does he treat them? Does he have, uh, you, you spoke about your oldest child before and how he was denying the, uh, the fact that your child had autism and had special needs. Yeah. So is he a scapegoat for uh, your husband and how does he treat uh, the others? He was a very detached father. Um, you know, he, he focused on work. That's, that was his main focus in life. I was the one who took the kids to all the doctor appointments, therapists, things like that. Um, we struggled getting my older son into um, a normal school in Ireland. Um, so then we had end up sending him to a private charter school which ended up being great for him. But like, he never went to a teacher conference or any of that. But funny, all of a sudden he decides that he'll coach our son's soccer team. So he actually coached one season. I really think it was because the other coach, you know, was a high level executive at the company. So it made him look good. Um, but with the other two, you know, he didn't do anything with them. So you've used a, a at least a couple of times, I don't know if it's a few times, you know, the the words, it made him look good. So when it comes to him, you know, it seems like he wants to go to work. He wants to look good for everyone at work. He's a diligent worker, a hard worker, I'm going to assume. But when it comes to the home life, he doesn't want really anything to do with that and becomes very judgmental about everything that's being done by you at the home, all of your actions, etc. And he will only do things to make himself look good when other people are watching. Exactly. So you have someone who really doesn't, when push comes to shove, doesn't want a family, it sounds like, and wouldn't know how to be a parent or how to care for their home or anything if it wasn't for you. Obviously here you probably feel, or I'm putting words in your mouth, that you're not liked. Um, It's not that abuse, abuse is going on. Physical abuse is going on. Verbal abuse is going on. But a feeling that they don't care at all, and maybe this person just hates me, and that now you're kind of, in this thing where they're only really thinking about them. They're not thinking about the kids. They're not thinking about you. They've really only thought about themselves and what makes them feel good and what gets them mad and not understanding at all that there are other people and that they have feelings and that they have needs uh, at all. So with that being kind of said, you know, what is your guys feeling about what I have just said and the realization that you've just come to of, you know, he doesn't really care. Yeah. And that was really hard for me, you know, that realization that he didn't care. And I guess, you know, I was in denial for so long. Um, but you know, I just out kept plugging away. Um, trying to think, well, maybe if I do this, he'll love me more. Maybe if I do this, maybe, you know, if I lose some weight, maybe if I, but, you know, nothing I ever did 
was good enough. You know, he, he critiqued every little thing. And I really, really was struggling with my older son. And he would never take any kind of action or role when it came to that. Um, and then if we he had, he had behavior issues, it was my fault. It was my parenting. It was my, or he would say, lack of parenting. You know what I mean? It's, it's almost like he encouraged my son and I to argue and, and have issues. And I was the rule enforcer. So let's say one of the kids acted up, I would say, okay, taking away screens or, you know, you're, you're not going to a sleepover tonight. Well, then he would come in and say, no, you can go or here's your computer screen. <laughs> Always making me be the bad parent. So we never were on the same page parenting wise, which was difficult, really difficult. So after this trip, what happens from here? Um, well, then we get transferred to Puerto Rico and he is now head of the Caribbean and South America. He's like the boss, the LFA, you know, has 500 to a thousand employees. We're living in a Ritz Carlton reserve neighborhood. We're living La Vida Loca lifestyle. And that's when it got really bad. So it was really fun, but then it was really bad. And so it's like the abuse would happen. And then he'd be like, oh, let's go to St. Martin, you know? And then again, oh, let's go take the kids skiing in Switzerland, you know? So it was always like, I'm sorry. And then he would make it up to me. But while we were there, I called the police. I don't even know how many times to help me. And half the time, they didn't speak any English. And he knew I wouldn't press charges because we relied on his income. You know, if I put him in jail, there went the family's income. So I was kind of stuck in a hard place. You know, and meanwhile, my son was getting really bad. He was having these huge fits. Um, he would get into these anger issues and he would break windows and doors. And, and at that point he was six foot tall, 200 pounds. I couldn't handle it. And it got to a point one Halloween, we were supposed to have a big party. My son went into one of his rages and beat me up. And then I tried to explain to my husband, I couldn't host a party that night. I had a broken ribs. I had a black eye, you know. And he got all mad at me, you know, and said it was my fault that I didn't handle it well. You know, again, denying that our older son had major issues. And so after that, I took off for a week to my brother's contemplating getting a divorce at that point because I was like, I didn't know how much longer I could do this. You know, my husband and my son were being physical with me. And it wasn't fair to the two younger children either. But I came back and he, I gave him another ultimatum. And I said, we, I can't help our son the way he needs help. And at that point, when I was away, funny, my ex had to call the police on my son because he actually had to watch the children that week. And he didn't realize my son, you know, you have to order two pizzas. You have to have a certain topping. It has to be from a certain place. You know, the children that are on the spectrum are very particular on their likes, needs, and wants. You know, he wouldn't wear anything with buttons or zippers or, and my, my husband didn't know any of it. So he had ordered the wrong pizza for my son and dropped a piece. And my son went into a full blown rage and he had to call the police on my son. So at that point, I think he, he saw a glimpse, you know, of that. Um, and so he agreed that we would find a specialist to help us figure out what to do with our son. And we ended up sending him to this nature camp in North Carolina. But at the time, my son kept saying he didn't feel well and his butt hurt. And when he got back, we had put together a whole game plan. Um, 
my ex was going to be, you know, on the same page with me parenting wise. But then my son ended up having a pilonidal cyst. And for the next three, four years, he had four surgeries or three surgeries over four years where I had to pack a wound every day. My son was home with me every day. This is like he's 15 through 18, you know, that age. And my ex never once went to a surgery, never changed a bandage. It was just like he checked out. So that was really difficult. And I couldn't leave. I couldn't pack up and leave with my son going through all those health issues. And and then, you know, at that point, I know my ex was cheating on me. He would have nail marks, physical nail marks on his back, fingernail marks. And I'm like, what is that? And he would say, oh, it's from the weight bench. And I go, how in the world does a weight bench make nail marks, perfectly nail marks on your back? And then he would call me crazy and delusional and blow things out of proportion. And then the next thing I know, I'm apologizing because I'm insecure and jealous. And he would just put you on this crazy wheel and there's just no getting off. And I had become depressed a shell of the person I once was. You know, I was head of the sortie, student council in college. I was going to take on the world. And now I was a cowering little child inside, you know, walking on eggshells, afraid to say anything, do anything that would set off, I call them the supreme being. Um, And that's where I really noticed he had like a Jekyll and Hyde persona. You know, you could just see him switch his face. He'd say something that was like this alter ego would just pop up. And I always knew it was about to erupt. It was scary. I can't begin to tell you like what a mind mess it was. And then he went off and started telling me what a horrible parent I am. And my son's issues are all because of me. And I'm a terrible parent and terrible wife. And I'm uh, exaggerating about everything, and I'm a hypochondriac. My knee shouldn't really hurt. And I remember him being very physical, and I went in and locked myself in my daughter's room, and he's pounding on the door trying to get to me. And I called my neighbors, and they came over, and they calmed him down because I knew the police wouldn't help anymore at that point. And then as soon as my neighbors left and I thought it was safe, he pounced on me the minute I walked out. And I was lucky to grab my car keys and I ran out to our garage. But I didn't have my phone. I didn't have my purse. Um, There was no way for me to leave the neighborhood and get back in. It was like late at night at that point, like two in the morning. And I just sat there and cried. I had thought. I have no future. I I was a horrible parent because he knew that's what hurts me most is because those kids were my life. And I started the car because it was hot. And I decided to leave it running with the garage doors because I couldn't deal with it anymore. And I don't know, by the luck of God, I woke up the next morning. You know, the garage is filled with fumes, but I'm still alive. So I stumble back inside, feeling really sick and nauseous. And he's like, where were you all night? And I told him, I said, I was out in the garage. And I said, I told him what I did. And he said, instead of giving concern or care, he said to me, well, that's another thing that you failed at. Like, I failed at killing myself. And it was just awful. Awful. So when we moved back to the state shortly after that, I had hired an attorney and I was ready to go. You know, at least I was back on U.S. soil. And then he professed his love. He said he would go to therapy. He started love bombing me again. He was sending me cards with words of affirmation every day. He, he threw me a birthday party, said he was going to take me on a cruise. But then my daughter was having some issues and we couldn't leave her. It was bad. 
um, you know, she was a teenage girl and, you know, back in the country and had some issues. And so I told him, I said, I don't think we can go on this cruise and leave our daughter. And he's like, well, I'm going. So he took my older son and went on my birthday cruise and I stayed home and took care of my daughter and my younger son. And while on that cruise, he bought me some jewelry and he came back and he's like, I really want to make our marriage work. But at that point, I was already done. I was done. So I had hired an attorney. I was holding out. I got my knee redone. They said that they couldn't believe I walked around on my knee. It was the, the cement hadn't held the prosthetic in place. So I had a knee replacement to fix my knee. It wasn't in my mind. <laughs> it really was bad. Um, and then we went on vacation with his family. It was the first time we had gone on vacation with his mother and his brother and sisters and everybody. And I planned a huge scavenger hunt for grandma. Um, we were given her a trip to New York and each place around the resort. I had a grandchild with a clue, you know, so one child would have an apple, one child would have a pizza, one would have a little taxi because we were giving her a trip to New York and wrote this whole rhyme. But the entire week, you know, it was five of us crammed into this little hotel room. My kids were 21 to age nine, 10. So um, and my oldest son just wanted to sleep all day and the other ones wanted to get up early and go swimming, you know, how those things work. Um, but it was our anniversary. And we were supposed to go We have dinner with his mom and her husband. And then we were supposed to leave the next day. And I was in the hotel room and the kids were talking disrespectfully to me. It had been a horrible day. We had gotten in, the kids had gotten a fight with their father at the beach. It was just a really long story, but it wasn't a good day. And we're all back in the hotel room racing to get ready for dinner with his mom. And the kids started being disrespectful to me, just like he was. And, you know, when I tried to set my boundary and say, hey, you know, what you're saying is disrespectful. Instead of correcting them, he jumped on the bandwagon. And that's when I snapped. It was like, I call it my light bulb moment. It's like a cum accumulation of time. And I, I say it's like a bucket of water and it's filled to the rim. And you put that last drop in and it just spilled over. And everything in my body and soul was screaming, I needed to get out. I needed to save myself, save my soul, um, that I couldn't get on that plane the next day to go home. I knew they had the week off school. I knew he had the week off work. And I was about an hour and a half away from my brother. So I said, I'm not going to dinner. Something's wrong. Because I had never had a panic attack before in my life. And I said, you guys go to dinner without me. And he got really angry. And he, it was more about how it made him look in front of his mother. You know, like I wasn't going to show up. He didn't care that I was having a panic attack or that something was wrong and I was upset. So he went off to dinner with the kids. And he called me back and he said, um, you know, the the they were running late. He could come back and get me if I was finally ready. And I said that I wasn't ready and I wasn't feeling good. And that's when he started calling me a selfish bitch and, you know, just using that kind of the same old, same old language that I was so used to hearing. And I said, I'm leaving. And he's like, what? I go, I'm leaving. I'm going to go to my brother's for the week. I need a break. Um, but there's just something telling me, like, I couldn't get on the plane the next day. I can't explain it. I like to call it divine intervention. But um, so when I told him that, instead of pleading with me to stay, he's like, you know, starts telling me how I'm a selfish, horrible person, horrible mother. I'm abandoning him. I'm abandoning my children. And I'm like, no, I, I just need a break. I'm going to go to my brother's for a week. Um, so I called the taxi and I left. Went down to my brother's and... He was away, so I ended up babysitting his dogs, and I explained to the kids I was just going to stay and visit my brother for a few days, 
And I immediately called my attorney and I said, file, I'm done. Um, but it was over, you know, December 28th, you know, it was New Year's, Christmas. So um, things were moving slow in the attorney's office. But by then I had her on, on retainer for three years. I, you know, I hung in there as long as I could. And then I got the call the next day that my father, who also lives in Florida, was in the emergency room. And they didn't know what was wrong with him. And after my mom had passed, he always said, who will take care of me? Who will be my advocate? And I, I always said to my dad, I'd be there. So it was a blessing that I didn't get on the plane and that I was in Florida. So I could go over and take care of my dad and find out what was wrong. But instead of my ex being worried about my father, he was sending me horrible messages. Again, saying I'm abandoning him, I'm abandoning family, I'm being selfish, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, my dad finds out that he blew a heart valve and that he needed to have surgery. But he's like 90 at the time. So they weren't sure if they could do it. And my dad was just sobbing. And so I'm holding my, my father sobbing, saying he doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to die. And in the meantime, my ex is demanding we talk to our marriage therapist the same day. And so I had to walk out of the hospital, leave my father crying. And I walked out and got on the phone and I said I wanted a separation because I wanted to buy myself some time, um, even though I'd filed the papers already with my attorney, but they hadn't been processed at that point. He didn't know that, though. And he said, no, either you're in or you're out. And I, I said, out. I didn't even hesitate. I knew it. It's when you get to that point, that fight or flight, your body and your soul are screaming, you got to save yourself. That's where I was. So I was there for a few weeks, got my dad set up, got him set up for surgeries, um, hired nurses, um, and then I had to fly back home. And he agreed over the phone that he would reside in the basement. I told him I wanted to get an apartment and we could exchange apartments or something, but I didn't think living together was a good idea, but he refused. His house, his home. But he agreed to live in the basement. So mind you, we lived in a 6,000 square foot house. The basement was 3,000 walkout. It was, a, it was a, like a house. And he agreed that he would move to the basement. But of course, when I get there, he didn't. And he refused to move out of the master bedroom. So then I had to get our therapist back on the phone and remind him of our conversation. And so sometimes he would sleep in the guest room and then I'd lock the bedroom door and he'd break the lock and come in. And he did it over and over. And then it got to the point that, and I call it my year of thorns, um, he would move out of the house. I thought my marriage was bad and, you know, his threats to destroy me and ruin me were bad. And I knew it was going to be bad, but nothing could have prepared me for the battle that laid ahead. Once I said I wanted a divorce and then I filed. So imagine everything increasing 100%. The anger, the fits, it was full on war. A war that he had to win at all costs. It didn't matter about the children or his job or anything. It was to take me down. Um, like I said, he, he broke into my bedroom. I'd get a locksmith, put on a lock. He'd call locksmith, and the locksmith would take it off. We spent $4,000 on locksmiths. <laughs> I had nowhere to keep my files because he kept breaking into my room. It got to the point where I had to, I had a bin with all my legal files, and I would carry it with me everywhere I went, carry it up the stairs to my bedroom, carry it to my car. But he was breaking into my car. He was breaking into my room. So then I had to keep it at friends' houses. He stole, I was writing a journal. My journal, I'm telling you, was the greatest thing I ever did. I kept a daily journal of what was happening. Another woman had given it to me who had gone through a bad divorce and said, write down everything. So every day I'd say, okay, today he broke into my bedroom. You know, today, da, 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 da. 
So for a year, I kept that journal and it stayed for me. Um, I later found out that he was, had people following me, hired detectives. I had nothing to hide. I was a faithful wife. I never cheated. Um, he had installed hidden cameras in the house, listening devices, tracking devices. He was stalking me. Um, and then he was beginning the smear campaign um, once the word of the divorce got out. But he kept saying, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. You know, he, was, he really wanted to keep that on the down low. Um, and I think the minute I, he realized I'd filed, he had another girl already. So he was flying down to Dallas to his new girlfriend. And I think he was doing a couple of girls at work at the same time. During that year, I called the police 11 times to the house with his abuse and rages and hurting me and assaulting me. But then again, he knew I wouldn't press charges because we relied on his income. Um, and then at one point, I ended up filing for exclusive use of home to get him out of the house. I had been working on videos and all the videos I'd been taking, I had my phone. Anytime you would walk in the room, I would record just to protect myself. And I was putting together this montage for court. And over the weekend, he, he came in when I was working on it in the office and wouldn't leave me alone. And he was peeking through the windows. He was videotaping through the glass pane doors. And anytime I would walk out, he'd walk in and look at all my papers and i I told him to stay out of the office. And he, he would stand in front of the screen and I'd tell him to move and he'd be like, no. And I'd tell him to get out and get out. And then he's like, you scratched me. I go, I didn't touch you. Well, then Monday morning coming for the exclusive use hearing, the police show up at my house and they say, um, your file's your, your, your husband's filed assault and battery charges against you, claiming you scratched him. And they said he sent a picture with a red mark on his arm. But then they said, funny, though, we went and interviewed him this morning, and he has no scratch on his arm. I'm like, yeah, because I didn't scratch him. But thank God I had recorded the whole thing. Um, and the police, you know, let that go. But I was lucky, and again, I swear it's divine intervention. I was literally on the floor crying. Couldn't believe my husband tried to put me in jail, the mother of his children. I thought my world had come to an end. I'm laying on the floor, and that's, you know, oh, I had heard that, well, before the police came, we had got notification that the judge was sick that morning, and it was postponed for a month. And I knew I couldn't go another month with the abuse that was escalating. And then the police showed up and tried to arrest me. And I, I just, I, I, what can I do? And so that's when I decided to go get a personal protection order. And I did it ex parte and I got it overnight. So it was actually a blessing because if I had gotten the exclusive use, they would have given him 30 to 60 days to get out. Um, but now with the personal protection order, he had to leave immediately. And by that point, I hadn't slept in months, terrified he would break in at any more, any point. You know, it's just break into my car, break into my bedroom. Um, so when I got that personal protection in order, it was like a gift from heaven. I could sleep. There was calmness in the house. But then he used the kids as weapons. You know, and mom kicked me out. Mom's going through all the money. Mom won't let me see you, which wasn't true. The whole time we kept, you know, communicating with him, saying, you know, when do you want to see your children? Let's put a visitation schedule together. Let's, you know, figure this out. But instead, he would meet with the kids um, and tell them to take things from the house and, you know, things that mattered to me. Like, I made these memory books, you know, next to my kids, these memory books of all the years we lived together, um, he had him take those. Like anything that mattered to me, he had the kids get, knowing it would upset me. And then in the meantime, he was fighting me legally with the personal protection order in court. I can't even begin to tell you how expensive that was. And I had a bad attorney. 
and it failed and he got back in the house. So I thought it was bad before. <laughs> it was like World War II times 10 when he got back in the house. So again, it's a, that's probably six months in. So I have six more months calling the police. I'm going to find, like, I'm going to the tire store to have them find the trackers on my car. You know, I, I go have lunch with a friend. I tell nobody where I've gone. And I come home and he's like, how was lunch with Julie yesterday? Like, he knew everywhere I went. Um, he was totally stalking me. I can't begin to tell you how that feels when someone's breaking into your room. They're stealing your items. They're following your every move. Um, that's when I found the hidden cameras, and he was spending excessively. Like, he was going to see his girlfriend, he was, and then he decided to take the kids all on trips. He took my daughter to Hawaii. He took my son to Vegas. And, I mean, like, extravagant trips. Um, he's taking money out left and right. I was lucky one day when <laughs> the bank called me. He he. He insisted we keep a bank in Chicago where we lived years and years ago. And they called me saying there was a problem with my husband's wire transfer. I'm like, wire transfer? We're not supposed to be moving anything. And I said, how much? And they said, it was $70,000 plus. And I said, what? I said, we don't have that kind of money in our account. And they're like, he walked in with a duffel bag of cash. And he was trying to wire it overseas. And... And one of the numbers had gotten transposed. And so I was still on the account and they called me. So I was very lucky that I discovered that. And then I took my son, my children, on vacation down to my brother's in Florida for spring break. And I went on my brother's computer and it said unknown device has logged in. Well, I was always using the home computer. So I said, sure, I'll check out the history. And then I went on it and I realized that he was hacking my email the entire divorce and back then this is before the two-factor authentication or whatever um and he had changed the recovery phone number to his own so i'm thinking i keep forgetting my password <laughs> and he'd get the notification you know um but it all made sense so when i would tell my attorney i want to file a show cause for all the money he's spending or something to do with, you know, the money he was moving overseas or whatever, the next day they would file some bogus motion against me. They're always one step ahead because he was reading all my emails. I really don't know how I got through it. I think at that point, it fueled my anger. It fueled my will to survive. You know, it's like something snapped in me. And I said, I am going to break free of this guy, whatever it takes. Um, and I did. But it was a battle of all battles. And we ended up doing psych evaluations. He kept saying I was crazy. And I, had, I have a degree in psychology. I wasn't crazy, but I was surely depressed. I started getting a rash all over my body. I was having physical symptoms I had never had before. I swear I woke up with wrinkles <laughs> that weren't there the day before from the stress and not sleeping. Um, it was really taking a toll on me. Um, but I agreed to it. I said, I'll take one if you take one. <laughs> and it was a very lengthy um, process. We had a packet of questions we had to fill out beforehand. Um, and then you went in and met with the evaluator. And I didn't know it, but they start to interview the minute you walk in the door. And so there's a secretary and there's another guy kind of standing behind her and he was making small talk. And I'm generally kind to everybody. And he and I hit it off. And then he's like, are you ready to start? I'm like, oh, are you my evaluator? And I knew immediately that this, was the same person who was evaluating, who had evaluated my husband. He was in the morning, I was in the afternoon. That my husband would have been condescending to. You know, he was kind of like a goofy looking guy. His pants were too short. He had a purple shirt on. 
um, bald with like a comb over ponytail and glasses and just kind of quirky. But I love quirky people. But that is the kind of person that my executive husband would have looked down upon and just dismissed right away. Um, so at that point, I was feeling very good about the evaluation. Um, and it was intense. You know, they did um, an intelligence portion, a memory portion, math, matching pictures. And he did it on computer, he did it on paper, and he did oral interviews. So it was really in-depth. Um, and then we were going through the whole process, and my ex would, wouldn't settle. He kept saying, zero. I will give her zero. He obviously didn't think 30 years of marriage warranted any kind of support. Um, it was awful. It was his house, his money, and I wasn't entitled to any of it. And so we were going to trial, and it wasn't until the day before trial where they had set up my deposition. And we got the results from the psych evaluation. And it was bad for him. Or severe personality disorder, detached parent. It was just, it just, it was everything. It validated everything for me that I knew deep inside. That I wasn't crazy. I wasn't the crazy one. And then with his deposition, I knew that that was kind of the final coffin when it came to him trying to take the children from me. Because he couldn't answer one question about his own children. So he agreed to settle. We still hadn't, we still hadn't um, distributed our personal property. And we still had to do that after the divorce was final. So I signed the divorce papers. And I tell you, I was so happy. I almost felt guilty for being so happy. I can remember walking out with tears of joy. Like, I wanted to do cartwheels down the parking lot. Um, and, like, then I felt guilty. I'm like, I shouldn't be feeling this way. I shouldn't be feeling so happy to be divorced from this monster I was married to. And then two days after the divorce was final, he got fired from his job. And it had nothing to do with me. From what I hear, because it's all sealed by the courts, it was, multiple sexual harassment cases, maybe even got an employee pregnant. There's no baby, but there may have been a pregnancy. I don't know. But then it was, again, it was war with the children. You know, we were fighting. We had it in writing in our divorce decree. You know, he would pay so much towards the kids' medical bills or you know, school supplies, and then he wouldn't pay it. And then he said he never agreed upon it. You know, and I agreed to take less than spousal support if he paid for the kids' college, because I didn't have a job at that point. And then, you know, after the divorce is finally, I never agreed to pay for that. I, I try to tell everybody that's going through something similar that I did is you don't engage as much as you can. But when you have children, you can't help but communicate with your spouse to let things go and... I ended up now helping people. I wrote a book and I wrote a divorce checklist to help people. Um, Because when you're divorcing a narcissist, if it's not in your judgment of divorce, you're screwed. You have to check every single box because they'll say, oh, that's not included. You know, that's that's under the canopy of child support or, you know, it's it's a Bible. It's a holy Bible. So I created a, a guide to help people too. And what other things have helped you in your healing process in the aftermath? Well, for me, I, I had to learn how to forgive myself. I was at, at when the, the, the marriage was over, 30 years relationship. Like, how in the world did I get to this place in my life? I was a smart woman. I was a good wife. I was an amazing mom. And, you know, I was conditioned over time and lost myself. I was a shell of the person I once was. I had no self-confidence. I didn't know where to begin. I didn't know where to live. I mean, it was really, really difficult. And so I started reading and I started researching. And that's when I realized I took the results from his psych eval and I read about personality disorders 
And then I started getting into narcissism. I said, oh my God, my story is not unique. It's universal. And how did I not see it? You know, and so for me, it was learning to forgive myself. There was nothing I could have done during the entire process differently. Sure, I sucked at setting boundaries, but whenever I tried to set a boundary, he came back at me tenfold. Um, and I used the example, people were like, why didn't you get out? Like, I use the story of the frog. When you place a frog in a pot of warm water, over time, you increase the temperature, it ends up boiling to death. If you place a frog in a boiling pot of hot water, he's going to jump right out. Well, I was that frog in that pot of warm water, and I jumped out during my panic attack to save myself. And then I started researching and realizing I didn't quit my marriage. I survived it. And I should be proud. And um, it took me like a good year where I read and I researched and I took my journal and I wrote it into a book and it helped me make sense of the process and what happened. And I would say, Oh, this is gaslighting. Oh, this is projection. Oh, like it was so textbook. And so I wanted to share that with everyone that's going through something similar. And for me, writing the book was therapeutic as well. Um, Cause it, it just it helped me understand how I got to that point and then conditioned and lost myself. But my, the biggest challenge I have, and I still say I have, is forgiveness. And there's this one um, post on Facebook. It's this woman priest, I can't remember her name, but it's called Forgive Assholes. <laughs> and it's so good because she says, you know, as long as you hold on to that anger, it's like a chain that binds you. And he's still winning. You know, even through his manipulations now to this day, he's still winning if I choose to hold on to that anger and not let go. And I like like the snow princess, let go. Um, and let that go and try and live the happiest life I can. And she says, imagine like wielding these bolt cutters. So anytime you really makes me mad or I start going back to those self-defeating thoughts and those negative thoughts that pop up in my brain. Like, it's almost like I can hear his voice. I just imagine those bolt cutters. I'm like, nope, I'm not going to let him control me. And, and I've tried different therapists. I've tried that theta healing. I've tried, um, it's a process. It takes time. It's not something you can get over overnight, especially know being conditioned for 30 years and if you had any words of wisdom for everyone listening what would they be now, someone asked me that yesterday it's interesting they said what would you tell yourself six years ago when you're going through it um i tell people don't wait i waited too long granted i was living in a foreign country but i should have gotten out sooner it's not going to get better if you do want to get out, plan your escape. Uh, make sure you have some money saved up. Make sure you have a safe place to go. Um, anything of value, make sure you keep it, hide it, take it. <laughs> because the narcissist will take anything and use anything against you that they can. Um, my ex even fought over my wedding ring. He didn't even pay for it. Um, it's crazy. Just the stuff. Um, and then my biggest one is um, believe in yourself. You know, there's those days that, you know, I tried to kill myself. There's those days I laid on the floor thinking, I can't go on. But you can. And there is a rainbow at the end. There is a light and there is happiness and there is freedom. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a really tough road, but you can do it. And now there's so many resources out there and people and support groups and channels like yours, you know, where people can gain insight and understand the manipulative tactics and understand that they're not the crazy ones and know that there's a happy future ahead. 
if they just believe in themselves. Well, Kimber, I really want to thank you for being here today, sharing your story, everything that you went through, and just making it a very clear story and, you know, getting into the really fine details of how you were feeling during a lot of these situations. And that's hard to do. And you went through a lot uh, with your family and you survived and you lived and we're happy that you're here to help other people. So just a big thank you for being here with us today. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm, I'm happy to share if I can give anybody some hope um, and you know, give them the insight and determination to break free. It's worth it. Well, thank you, Kimber, for being here once again. And if you want to read Kimber's book or get her divorce checklist, click the link in our show notes that we are leaving there. And if you want to be a guest like Kimber was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. Click on that button in there. You can read all of our instructions. And either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And also at our website, we have a support group. So if you need support, we have a support group by clicking on the Support Group button at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday nights, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards. We have forum board. Ah, we have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you. It's a wonderful group of people on there, and you can make a lot of friends too. So, if you need support, join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at domesticshelters.org. And at domesticshelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of everything that you're dealing with and they have every phone number email address and web address for shelters and agencies no matter how big or small the town you are in domesticshelters.org has it there so if you need extra support please do go to domesticshelters.org and we have other friends of the show called shelter movers and shelter movers can be found at sheltermovers.com and what they do is they help you move all of your stuff from your home and into storage and that includes your pets and livestock too so if you're trying to get out of domestic violence and course of control and you need help leaving the home getting all of your stuff out of your home and into storage sheltermovers.com they can help you it is only available in canada and it is a donor supported charitable organization so if you need help from them or want to donate to them go to sheltermovers.com. And that is it for today's survivor story, for today's episode. So for myself and Kimber, we hope you have a good night.